Yes, it's very quiet, Alexis. Um, it's about five minutes past now, so we'll get started. Um, I see Alexis, Joe, and Michelle from the TOC. If there's someone else I missed, um, let me know via text. But uh, we have a full schedule today, so we might as well get uh, started. So we have three project presentations today. So this is our TOC meetings that dedicated to community presentations and hearing from projects out there that have been in the backlog. Um, we have three today. We have NSM, Key Cloak, and Strimzy that we'll be uh, presenting. So we'll each give them about uh, 15 minutes to present with some times for questions, and then we'll go from there. So without any you know, further wasting time, let's uh, have the NSM community uh, present. I'll hand it off to Ed, I believe. Sure. Do you want to draw the slides or do you want me to draw the slides? Uh, yeah, Taylor's going for it. So if uh, you feel I'm, like... I'm fine letting Taylor drive. OK, awesome. cool. All right, enjoy. Uh, network service mesh. So Kubernetes networking actually does a fairly brilliant job of optimizing for the average case, right? It, it puts the things the developers care about front and center in the API, you know, which are things like L3 reachability, network policies for isolation, services to give you some very basic load balancing functionality. And it completely hides most of the implementation details that developers don't care at all about, like interfaces, subnets, et cetera. And, and this is super well done. Next slide. But it doesn't actually handle every case that people are wanting to do around networking in Kubernetes. So there are a, a bunch of cases, and you know, the more we dig into it, the more these come up. You know, Cloud Native NFE is one, various L2, L3, enterprise, interdomain use cases come up a lot. And there's a whole lot of other kinds of things innovation-wise that people are wanting to try that don't fit very well into the standard Kubernetes networking model. And, and that's fine, actually. Um, next slide. And so people look at Istio to solve a lot of these things. And Istio is super good if the problems you're looking to solve live at L7, right? If you're dealing with HTTP messages, it's probably the solution you're looking for. That's not what Network Service Mesh does at all. But it's less good for things where your payloads are Ethernet frames, IP packets, or other kinds of things that live below L7. So you can sort of take two approaches to what you're going to do about the un, 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 you know, unmet use cases. And we've seen both people in the community advocate for both of these approaches. The first on the left is not what we're advocating here with Network Service Mesh. It's sort of the change all the things, right? Keep extending the Kubernetes networking to be all things to all people bring in subnets, bring in interfaces, bring in all these concepts that it looks like we've tried very hard to avoid forcing developers to deal with. And then the other approach, and this is sort of the approach on the right that Network Service Mesh has taken, is let's step back and rethink entirely what we're doing. Let's put aside the 1990s networking concepts and ask ourselves, what would a more cloud native approach look like? And we took a lot of inspiration from the stuff that was written in the cloud native definition right, immutable infrastructure, loosely coupled, minimal toil. So we started with the presumption that Kubernetes was not going to change for these use cases, which are a small minority of what people want to do. Um, and so we had to figure out what to do with the existing infrastructure to meet those needs. And we have done that. Um, loosely coupled, meaning how do we make it so you don't get one giant glom of networking? Uh, instead, you get a loosely coupled system of how your networking works so that you can compose together the things that you actually want in, in very much a microservice model. And the third one was minimal toil, which is developers still don't care about subnets, IP addresses, and other minutia of networking, nor should they ever have to care. Um, and so how do we put the system together in a way that imposes minimal toil on the developers? And the good news is there are excellent patterns to steal from everywhere in Kubernetes on this, which is let them ask for named things with metadata in the form of labels. And so we, we've absolutely taken that approach. Cool. So human beings tend to think better in stories. And so I will often explain network service mesh in terms of a story um, because it gives you a flavor for the kind of thing we're doing. And in this case, the story is Sarah and secure internet connectivity. Next slide. There we go. So the protagonist in this story is Sarah. She's writing a Kubernetes app to be deployed in the public cloud. And one of the pods in her app, not all of them, not the whole cluster, one of the pods in her app need secure access to her corporate internet. So from her point of view, this is what her problem looks like, right? Next slide. She still wants her normal Kubernetes networking because that's freaking awesome. But she also, next slide, 
wants to be able to send and receive traffic to her corporate intranet. And she wants to do this securely. Um, for some definition of securely, she doesn't really want to understand the minutia of. In fact, um, I, I'm generally of the opinion that for many developers, the definition of security is that which makes InfoSec leave me alone. So we introduced then Ariadne, next slide, the network service mesh spider, who is sort of the mascot for the program. And, and so talking a little bit about network service mesh, next slide. So you can think of network service mesh as handling things below the sort of L4 through L7 that normally is handled by service mesh in Istio. Instead, it handles payloads that are IP packets or ethernet frames or possibly more exotic things. Next slide. So again, back to Sarah's fundamental problem. Still wants Kubernetes networking, but also wants to be able to get uh, secure connectivity to corporate internet. Next slide. So in network service mesh, the way you do this is you define a network service. Uh, a network service is very analogous to a normal service in Kubernetes. Um, it has a name. <clears throat> it also has a spec, which has a payload. This simply tells you the kind of thing that you're getting from your network service in terms of its handling. This could be ethernet, it could be IP, it could be more exotic things. But effectively, it handles the thing that you need to handle. I know Kubernetes tends not to think in terms of L2, and I frankly am deeply pleased by this, but we do have people who occasionally do have use cases that require ethernet frames to float about. Cool. Again, a lot like service resources in Kubernetes. Next slide. And then, the only thing that you would have to do if you're Sarah to get this is deploy something for your VPN gateway and add a single line annotation naming the network service you want to your pod. Next slide. So conceptually, network service mesh has three basic concepts. The first is the network service we've already introduced. This is fundamentally the intersection of connectivity, security, quality of service, whatever it is that you want in the abstract to happen uh, in terms of the service you want from the network. Next slide. And an example here would be secure internet connectivity. Next slide. The second concept we have is a network service endpoint. This is very analogous to endpoints in Kubernetes. It is the concrete implementation that does the thing that you want. Next slide. Again, like endpoints in Kubernetes. And so in this example, a VPN gateway pod, something that would do admission control and do whatever it has to do to talk to your corporate VPN concentrator would be an example of this. And then the third concept is this L2, L3 connection. This will often pop up in Sarah's pod as an interface, but conceptually it's just Sarah sends traffic to her corporate intranet and it gets there. Next slide. <clears throat> But we all know that things don't stay simple. If you started in a world with a VPN gateway pod, eventually your InfoSec people are going to want you to interpose other things that do, for example, firewall rules based on policy between Sarah's pod and the VPN gateway. Or you know, it will inevitably become more complicated. You'll have IDS boxes and IPS boxes and a whole host of other things that people want functionally along this chain. And so Network Service Mesh has the concept of composing these things together. So you can have multiple pods that are offering the same network service, secure internet connectivity, some of whom are also consuming it because they don't do all the work for that. And network service mesh will allow you to chain them together. Next slide. And the way we do this actually borrows very heavily from a lot of what happens in Istio with, um, with virtual services. So every pod in the system that is exposing a network service say firewall pod and VPN gateway pod. They're both exposing the network service secure internet connectivity, but they can expose them with what we call destination labels. In this case, app equals firewall and app equals VPN gateway. Next slide. Um, when the firewall pod offers secure internet connectivity, it realizes it doesn't really know how to do that. It knows how to do a piece of that. So it also requests it and it can put a label on its request. We call this a source label. Uh, in this case, app equals firewall. Next slide. And you can expand your definition of your network service beyond just name and payload to have a list of matches that will match source selectors and route them to destination selectors, possibly with weights. Next slide. And so a match matching app equals firewall gets directed to the VPN gateway pod because it has app equals VPN gateway. 
Next slide. And then when Sarah's pod comes in with no labels on her request, you will fall through eventually to a match that matches anything. Next slide. And it will send you to a destination that is the beginning of the chain. And so in this way, you actually get very loose coupling between these network service endpoints that are doing part of the work because the firewall pod has no idea what comes next. All it knows is it provides part of a service and then it consumes the rest of it. And you can simply add an IDS between the firewall and VPN gateway pod just by changing the network service definition in order to augment your policy. Excellent. So this is super important because it means you get a minimal blast radius when IT inevitably decides that something else has to happen here. You have to have additional pieces of the chain. Next slide. So you'll note here that, that Sarah, the developer, never sees IP, subnets, routes, or interfaces. For folks who are interested, I could talk about the technical details of how we handle that. Um, but they're never anything that actually impinges on the developer. Next slide. Um, also, this does not require any Kubernetes upgrades. We don't need any changes in Kubernetes at all to make this work. And you can continue using whatever CNI plugin you wish to use in order to get your traditional Kubernetes networking because we're completely orthogonal to CNI. And then at the, getting back to the end here with community. Um, so for community, we have stars, 132, about 46 forks. We've got code contributors from about contributions from about 22 folks. Typically, our weekly community meetings tend to be a little bit above two, uh, 20 folks. Um, there's a fair bit of interest. We are currently running over 1,600 views from our KubeCon talk. And we're getting a bizarrely large number of views on our weekly meetings. I don't quite understand why. And then we have a number of different companies who are involved as existing sponsors who are working on aspects of this problem. Questions? <clears throat> yeah, questions. We got uh, five, about five minutes for questions. I've got one, um, if nobody else has. Um, so I was curious about uh, the approach. So, so the, the decoupled approach and the fact that the developer uh, and launcher of the, the application doesn't really need to know much about what's happening in the backend, but it seems that the current API kind of determines the implementation being a, a string of pods down this um, service chain, we can call it that, um, which, which typically has big performance implications. Have you given any thought to uh, changing the implementation, which would seem not to impact the application end of the API? Um, so are, are you basically saying that there are some circumstances in which a string of highly granular pods to do your network work is probably less efficient than a single monolithic one? Uh, yes, or a piece of hardware or, or whatever, um, you know, yeah. But basically pushing Ethernet frames through, you know, half a dozen uh, containers is not a quick way to get your frames from one place to another. No, no, no. So absolutely. So one of the things that I, I, I have not got into in this presentation because of the limitations of time is the network service mesh architecture itself, while it fits beautifully with Kubernetes, and we've done a lot of work to make it work well in Kubernetes, is not actually welded to Kubernetes. And so within the architecture, you could be getting your network service from the physical network. You could be getting it from a VM running in some VIM somewhere. Um, it's very agnostic on that on the point of where it's actually running. And in addition, the, the architecture is completely agnostic as to how um, how you know, essentially granular you break the work up into or how monolithic you make it. Um, so one of the things in discussions with people who are looking at building building network services that we've has a, had as a discussion is you sort of have two ways if you're building a network service endpoint that you can use network in network service mesh. The first is just getting you that first hot plug. Somebody has a workload, you want to get granularity of the workload plugging into your network service. At that point, you can leave network service mesh and do whatever thing it is you're going to do for anything that happens past that point, right? Um, the second way you can use it is if you do have this composition chaining effect that you would like, you can use network service mesh to achieve that. But the architecture itself is very agnostic as to when you get off the bus, because there are going to be a lot of different answers as to what's the right way to approach that problem. Okay, yeah, that, that partially addresses my question. My question was actually more about uh, if, if a service mesh, or sorry, a, a network service required, you know, half a dozen of these sub-services, uh, have you given any thought to actually composing those into a single implementation rather than six pods, which I think was what was in the presentation? Oh, 
that, that's entirely up to whoever is building the network service endpoint. Network service mesh is giving you the virtual wires to connect them. Okay. You as the implementator, implementer of the network service endpoint can decide the degree to which you would like to centralize all of that in a single blob or disaggregate it into multiple blobs. And you know, quite honestly, I am not smart enough to know what the, I don't think there's a universal right answer for that. I think you will see a lot of experimentation as people figure out the, again, it's the normal trade-off between efficiency by centralizing versus flexibility by decentralizing. And, and one of the really exciting things in this space is we have no idea what the right answer is really. We have notions, but we don't really know. And people are going to experiment and figure out. Thank you. Cool. I see it as, see it, see it as a being a bit like K-native, very low level, group of building blocks, put it together how you like. Um, exciting if you're a low level person, but potentially confusing if you're a high level developer. Um, confusing how? For the same reasons that Quintum was asking about, that you know you might not know how to assemble things uh, as, as easily as an expert would. Ah, no, I, I see your point about disaggregation and then that will vary. Uh, the reason I was asking for clarification is from the point of view of the consuming workload, um, I, I wasn't sure how we could make it simple, simpler than it is. But I, I think your underlying point is if I'm someone who is building a network service that I want to offer, um, then you know there are options there and, and you know disaggregation does introduce complexity. There's no question about that. You always have to trade the value of that against the cost. Yep. Cool. I think that does about us for, for time right now. So thank you, uh, Ed. I posted the proposal from the um, NSM team uh, on GitHub. So feel free to take a look at it. It already has kind of cleared the bar for the sandbox and two TOC sponsors from Joe and Matt. But other than that, uh, thank you, Ed, for your time. And if you have questions, reach out to their community. Thank you. Cool. All right, let's get next. So, so uh, can you hear me? Yeah, hear you, hear you well. Go uh, for it. Stan, does your sound work? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. OK. Right, so we would like to present Kikog project to you. Uh, I'm Boleslav Davidovich, and with me is Stian Torgersen, who is a co-founder and a project lead, and he'll take it off. Yeah, so OK, so first of all, what is Kikog? Well, it's a centralized authentication and authorization services for modern applications and services. Uh, we built it focusing on usability for applications application developers, uh, trying to make it as easy as possible to install Keycock, as well as easy to secure applications and services with Keycock. Uh, we wanted it to be a ready out of the box solution, uh, not requiring you to bring your own user store or uh, having to implement login pages and other related pages, uh, allowing application developers to focus on, on their business logic rather than the art of authenticating users. Okay, next slide. So with regards to centralized authentication, we have support for OpenID Connect and SAML. Uh, this allows, obviously, the applications to delegate all authentication to Keycook. Um, and applications are also able to obtain uh, tokens that allow them to now invoke APIs as services um, with end-to-end uh, -end user authentication. Uh, and of course, this works for microservices. It, it also works on Istio and, and other sort of deployments like that. So next slide. Uh, we also have support for centralized authorization. So if you want to delegate uh, the permissions and, and associated policies, uh, you can do that to Keycock and, and then fully centrally manage access to all services from, from Keycock. Next slide. Uh, as I said, we have uh, all the login pages that you put, you require, uh, as well as allowing users to self-register, allowing users to recover their password or configuring OTP and all other things so that you don't have to develop those for your own applications. Next slide. Uh, we have an extensive admin console that allows the admin to manage most of the aspects of the Keycock server. And we also have an account console that allows uh, your end users to manage their own accounts. And of course, we have a uh, company in REST API, so you can bake this kind of capability into your own applications if you want to. Uh, OK, next slide. 
So Kiko can federate uh, identities from a number of locations. Um, so as I said, we can use the internal Kiko database uh, for your users, but we can also load uh, identities from LDAP, Active Directory, any custom user store. Uh, we can also do identity brokering to external OpenID Connect, SAML identity providers. Um, we also have a bridge into Kerberos desktop logins. And we also have a, a large number of uh, built-in support for social networks. Next slide. Um, not only do we do um, uh, scaling and high availability within inside a single site, we also have support for replication across multiple sites. Next slide. So it's easy to secure your applications and services with Keycoke. Uh, you have a few. Uh, options depending on what uh, type of application you have. Uh, we have a number of uh, Keycoke specific client adapters. We also have the Keycoke Gatekeeper project, which is a um, reverse proxy solution that can be deployed as a sidecar. Um, we also, of course, support both OpenID Connect and SAML2. Uh, so you can use any compatible libraries here, or if your applications already have support for one of these, you should be sorted. Okay, next slide. Um, Kiko is pretty opinionated and we try as much as we can to avoid feature creep. Uh, but at the same time, Kiko is ex highly extensible and you can customize it a lot when you need to. Some examples here is that you can completely replace the whole authentication flow and provide complete uh, alternative ways of authenticating users. Uh, for the login teams and the uh, account consoles, uh, you can style these with a little bit of style sheets, or you could go in and you can modify the HTML templates, or you could go as far as providing your own implementations for your pages. And we also have some examples from the community uh, where we have some custom federation protocols uh, where as an add-on or extension to Kiko, uh, you can now get support for instance, for CAS and WS federation. Next slide. Uh, a few things on our roadmap. So to highlight is uh, we are planning to migrate to a Kubernetes native Java stack uh, called Quarkus. This will allow us to significantly reduce uh, startup time as well as memory footprint, and we'll get uh, numbers comparable to Go-based projects. Um, we're also going to work a lot on uh, improvements around the storage, focusing on support for zero downtime upgrades, as well as improving and uh, simplifying the multi-site setup. We'll also be looking at potentially using ETCD for persistence as an alternative to the current uh, relational database persistence layer that we have. Uh, we'll soon be adding uh, support for operators as well as observability. Um, we'll also be looking at allowing you to develop custom code for Keycoke um, externally, so to, to write this in any language or framework that you want and host this alongside of Keycoke instead of today where we only support Java custom code that is deployed directly inside Keycoke. Uh, and this will also help with uh, allowing us to have better API contracts over the long run. Um, and finally, we'll be looking at adding support for web authentication, uh, which will allow us to have a stronger standardized based authentication, both for two-factor as well as for uh, passwordless experiences. So Kiklog as a project started uh, 2013. Uh, it faced quite rapid adoption, mainly because the prototype behind it solved a real problem uh, and it made it very easy and quick for developers to secure their application. Uh, and as you can see on a graph from GitHub, over time we had a, a steady and pretty decent amount of external contributions. Next slide, please. There are a few community statistics worth highlighting, especially uh, a decent uh, traffic on the mailing list. Worth mentioning is also the Docker image pull count. Actually, we're, we were or originally scheduled to present the, this deck to TOC in October. Back then, this number was around 5 million, so it more than doubled in half a year. And this kind of speaks for itself. Next, next slide, please. Uh, same for website traffic, we've seen uh, we, it tripled during the past 18 months. And we also observed that we had pretty mar, much linear growth like this uh, since the beginning of the project. Next slide. 
we tried to gather some data from uh, GitHub profiles of people contributing to, to Keycloak. Those were the company names which came up with those profiles. Several of those are uh, already CNCF members. Uh, for example, Hitachi made a number of great contributions uh, for features needed to secure financial APIs. And we have plenty of examples of contributions like this. Next slide. We have also run a community survey asking a, a number of questions how Keycloak is being used. Uh, one of the questions was, are you willing to be a public reference? And those were the company names which came up uh, agreeing. Uh, and again, you can see quite a few recognizable brands here. We know from side conversations, there are many other brands using Keycloaks internally, Keycloak internally. Next slide. Uh, Technology Radar by Toughworks is actually quite recognizable, recognizable uh, report uh, among uh, application developers. The way they pictured us uh, claiming like we are a solution that makes it easy to secure applications or microservices with little, little to no code actually made us really proud because they essentially captured our mission statement. Uh, next slide. In the mentioned survey, one of the questions we asked was how you deploy Keycloak. And if you add up Docker, Kubernetes, AWS, and OpenShift, you can see that pretty much two thirds of Keycloak deployments uh, reported by our community are in cloud uh, related environments. So this also speaks a lot. Next slide. And this is among many reasons we think that we fit uh, CNCF nicely. So we, are, we have a very healthy community with number of contributions. As Stan highlighted, we try to be focused, avoid feature creep, and really uh, focus on embracing future-facing standards like OpenID Connect and OAuth 2, both being already adop widely adopted in cloud-native ecosystem. We primarily aim application developers. We are lightweight, portable, and highly customizable. Next slide. Uh, so we would like to ask to become a sandbox project at CNCF. We hope that this would boost our community adoption even further. Uh, would love to take part in the security SIG, which we know is being formed right now. And on a very practical side, uh, current Currently, CI testing is funded by Red Hat and happening on internal infrastructure. We would love to change it with CNCF resources. And that was our last slide. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. Any questions for the folks? Hey, Chris, I know when we originally were going to um, propose this, you know, the project has yep. grown a lot in the last six months. Do we yep. still feel like Sandbox is appropriate? Kind of feel like there's a, a pretty wide base and um i mean of course we want more adoption but i think it's been adopted more than what we had in our original one do you feel like it could maybe skip sandbox i mean i will defer to the toc on that i think first you need to find a toc sponsor uh, or two for the sandbox or one to uh, push you for kind of an incubation vote um I, personally i think it's a, a bit borderline but i i'd kind of defer to the TOC on, on their opinion here since they make the judgment call at the end of the day. Okay. Any yeah, I, I had a related question actually, which is uh, the project is what about five, six years old now. So I'd be curious if there are any reasons why we don't think it meets the incubation criteria, because if it doesn't after five or six years, you know, that raises questions in itself. Yeah, I so, think I, I think, you know, my, my biggest concern here is that you know, I, and I don't know much about key, key cloak, but like, you know, hearing about the, the plans for improving the way that it gets deployed makes me think that it's a little bit of the, and, and you know, a traditional Java application. And so I think one of the things that um, I would want to look at carefully when we look at sort of, you know, moving towards an incubation level would be something like, you know, is is deployment something that is feels very natural on something like Kubernetes or other dynamic environments? Um, are there extensibility hooks that uh, are usable without sort of building jars? And it sounds like those things are on the roadmap, and I think that's that seems like things are moving in the right direction there. But it also seems like those are those are very nascent.
And my my overall preference would be to, um, you know, to get them into the incubation, like, you know, quickly, um, and then start to have that that conversation, or sorry, get them into sandbox quickly, and then and then ha start to have that conversation, because um, I think if we if we try to skip over sandbox, then we're going to have to, you know, we're going <laughs> to spend spend more time kind of kind of circling on it and, and trying to figure it out. So that would be kind of my preference. And then maybe have maybe have them try to immediately start working on that on on what what kinds of things like that Joe mentioned for graduation. Does that make sense? So you're proposing sandbox to get them in early and then work with them to move towards uh, the next level, which requires a higher level due diligence, if I understood that correctly, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, it would it would be yes, exactly. Don't wait a year to do that. Just let's get going on that next. You know, let's get going on that now. But let's get them into the sandbox. Are you willing to sponsor them then, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, well, we're we're um, I'll follow up, but I mean, we're we're considering them for um for authentication for it too so yeah i'd be happy to uh sponsor them so. all right i think doing a call on the toc mailing list asking for toc sponsors and input is probably the best step over since you have one through through jeff now okay thank you jeff i have uh, one yeah. more so, have uh, time. i'll catch up with you guys uh later but yes <laughs> okay quinton go ahead uh, yeah, if we have time. Um, so so the, the, the sort of elephant in the room when it comes to um, centralized authentication authorization is typically uh, high availability and and scalability, um, because if, if the centralized thing is either unavailable or slow, uh, so are all the applications that rely on it. Um, and there wasn't much talk about that in the presentation. It sounded, uh, and I'm maybe putting words in your mouth here, that there is a some centralized server here that does all this work, and if it's unavailable, then the service is unavailable. Is is that true, or do you have a better story than that around high availability and horizontal scalability? There is a cross-site support. So I guess the best example, if you go to access.redhat.com uh, to log in as a Red Hat customer, actually it's uh, Red Hat SSO behind it, and it's uh, cross-site replicated. So if one site goes down, the other should pick up. Okay, but but in a given site, you just have one server, and when that fails, you have to fail. No, it, it's clustered. There is a cluster behind, so it's it's cross-site re replication of clustered uh, servers. So it's a traditional What's clustering, uh, so multiple nodes, and then you can replicate uh, between sites as well. Okay. What's the clustering technology there? Is this some sort of you know L two thing, or or is it something? like RAP or leader election type stuff? So currently, it's what in, in JVOS application server or Red Hat Enterprise application platform, so InfiniSpan based uh, clustering. Do you, need, um, do you need access to Red Hat to be able to run it? I mean, when you say Red Hat, uh, you know, enterprise application platform, that makes me think that yeah, it's Red sorry, Hat. I, I was referring to the Red Hat de deployment. No, but the, the community one, uh, Wi-Fi. So everything at Red Hat has, uh, it's on my manager account, but everything at Red Hat has an upstream version. So you have an InfiniSpan uh, and you have Wi-Fi uh, server. So how, do you have statistics on how many users are using the Red Hat version versus how many are using the community version? Mm, not at hand, but... Yeah. Like we that's something that I'd be, be very interested to see if, if folks use it outside of the context of, of a, a Red Hat um, Enterprise License Agreement. Oh, certainly. So every, all the names we mentioned in the presentation are not product related. So all of this is purely community data. I don't have any permission to kind of like leak the, the customer data. And uh, also uh, we know that like from the mailing list, we know that there are pretty serious deployments. Uh, actually, even people approaching multi-tenancy with it to a certain extent. I think I think we'll continue the discussion on the mailing lists um, 
and we'll kind of go from there and kind of seek input from the TOC and, and maybe an additional TOC sponsor. So thank you um, for your time. And given that we have 20 minutes left, we should respect uh, the last project uh, to go. So next up, I think is Strimzy. That's how you pronounce it. That's right. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> All right, go um, ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's David Ingham. I'm an engineering director at Red Hat, and I've got some of my uh, engineering colleagues with me today who are uh, hands-on with this project. So in a nutshell, Strimzy is a fully open source project that's focused on the deployment and management of Apache Kafka on Kubernetes. So essentially it contains container images for Kafka and Zookeeper, which is a prerequisite component of a Kafka cluster. Um, and provides operators for managing and configuring the cluster um, and also the topics and users that, um, that are running on that cluster. Um, and yeah, like the slide says, leverages the power of Kube for scaling and high availability, etc. I'll talk about that a little bit. Next slide, please. Um, so why are we bringing this to CNCF? Um, well, this this chart's interesting. So this came from the recent um, Apache Kafka survey that illustrates how people are deploying Apache Kafka. And you can see that there's 34% here that are focused on Kubernetes. Um, and this is an increasing trend. So in my experience working with customers, increasingly um, organizations are looking to deploy Apache Kafka close to the workloads that are um, consuming and producing messages into the into the event streams. Next slide, please. So there's a lot that's great about um, running Kafka on Kubernetes. So Kafka itself can be a pretty daunting application to um, to deploy and uh, provide ops for. You can think of it as a uh, cluster database management system as an analogy. So there are, there are many components. Typically you'll run with a cluster of several broker instances. Um, you'll have several Zookeeper instances. You'll have other components for something called Kafka Connect, which is interacting with third party systems or Mirror Maker, which is about replicating a topic between sites. So you'll have, you'll have a large number of processes that are um, that are used to support Apache Kafka. And dealing with that, you know, providing the ops support for that, dealing with the physical servers, the scalability, et cetera, is a real task. And Kafka on Kubernetes really simplifies what it takes to be able to deploy and manage a cluster like this um, with, with a much lower operational overhead. Um, so the focus is that, you know, we provide configuration as code um, through custom resources that I'll talk about and operators that manage those custom resources to interact with the Kafka components to do the, the deployment. Um, okay, next slide, please. So as we know, Kubernetes provides a number of um, underlying facilities for dealing with stateful components, um, but it's still, a pretty complicated task. So specifically Kafka needs oh, a list of the things here, like stable broker identities, uh, a way to do discovery, um, provisioning, the management of durable state, being able to reattach to durable state in the event of a failure. Um, and you can, and there are raw capabilities, increasingly Kubernetes is moving to uh, address uh, stateful applications like this. So there are these raw primitives that are provided, but it's still quite a complex task. And rather than have every everyone that's looking to deploy Kafka on Kubernetes have to deal with these low level primitives, it makes a great deal of sense to provide a common way of doing this, um, which sort of lowers the barrier of entry for deploying and managing Kafka clusters. That's the premise. Next slide, please. So um, I mentioned operators. I'm, I'm sure most folks are, uh, are familiar with operators that are part of this call, but essentially we use custom resource definitions to define the different entities that we're working with. So the clusters, topics, users, etc., And then we use the operators to monitor those custom resources and make changes to the system, make forward progress to the system to 
make the real implementation match the desired implementation that's provided in the custom resources. So we're observing, we're comparing the current state, and then we're uh, acting on that. Thank you, next slide. Um, so we have three operators. There's the cluster operator. So this is responsible for, when well, its primary role is for managing the cluster. So here you provide a, a definition where the, uh, the number of uh, broken nodes that you would like, configuration of those broken nodes, and configuration of the storage uh, in the form of a, a custom resource. And then the operator monitors those custom resources and will deploy or update or delete the cluster based upon, um, based upon your wishes. When you have a when you have an operate when you have a cluster up and running, that's where the topic operator comes into play. So the topic operator uses a custom resource that describes a topic in terms of its name, number of partitions required, number of replicas, etc., and will work with the APIs of Kafka to bring those topics into existence on the cluster. And there's a in interesting technical uh, point here in that. Using different features of Kafka, it's possible for topics to be created in other ways. For example, if you're using the streams, the Kafka streams API, then that will result in topics being created on your behalf. Um, and one of the things that we do in the topic operator is uh, do a, a three-way diff to ensure consistency is maintained across the system. Hey, David, this is Alexis. Can I interrupt for a sec? You may. Hi, Alexis. Um, I, maybe I'm, hi, maybe I missed this, but, um, is the cluster operator also getting rid of some of the zookeeper faff that, that Kafka sometimes comes with? It, the cluster operator manages the zookeeper faff for you. So you don't have to deal with uh, spinning up a manager, managing um, zookeeper pods yourself. Um, that's implicitly managed by the, um, by the cluster operator. And I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. Okay. Um, yeah, and then finally, the, the user operator is responsible for um, managing users. The cluster operator also looks after other components, and so Kafka Connect, Mirror Maker uh, components, as well as the uh, Kafka brokers themselves. Next slide, please. So this is just a, emphasizing the point. So, you know, it's a Kubernetes definition, a Kubernetes native definition of the different components of the system. So the, the first um, snippet here is a, uh, the Kafka custom resource, and then the middle we have the topic, and on the right hand side we have the user. So this is what gets picked up by the operators. Thank you. Next slide. Um, I think if you push the next slide, we might see some animation. Yeah. So here, what's happening is the operator is picking up the custom resource and is spinning up the Zookeeper nodes, and then we'll spin up the Kafka broker nodes. Um, it will also instantiate the topic and user operators um, uh, on, on your behalf. So the only thing that you need to deploy is the cluster operator. Um, next slide, please. And one more time, I think. Yeah, and then when we make a change to the cluster and an update is required, the operator is embodied with the intelligence to do the, the appropriate rolling deployment of the various components. So this is something that um, requires a little bit of skill. Es essentially, what we're, what we're doing here is taking knowledge that, that typically the Kafka operator, the human Kafka operator would have, and we're trying to automate that and uh, embody the, the, the software operator to do these tasks on the user's behalf, therefore minimizing the amount of work required and lowering the barrier of entry. Next slide, please. So the um, so following on from that point, the ambition is to really take that to to the limit. So to um, improve the system with smarts for dealing with automatic configura reconfiguration. So a concept called cluster balancing, which is something that one typically needs to do with a Kafka cluster, um, to provide automatic scaling, to look for anomalies in configuration, etc. So the 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 goal is to make it possible for anyone to be able to operate a Kafka cl cluster for a commercial production deployment um, with, uh, with a lot less specialist knowledge. Next slide, please. So in terms of community, 
Uh, I've just got a couple of slides here similar to what we've seen in the other presentations. So the work began uh, in October 2017 in earnest and you can see the, the data there. Um, so it's a, a pretty popular project um, and we've had uh, consistent contribution through, throughout that period. Um, next slide please. And uh, similarly in terms of uh, website growth. I don't have analytics before um, September 2018, so I, I can't show you what happened before that. But in the time between then and now, we've seen um, uh, about a 250% growth in uh, monthly visitors. We've got a pretty active Slack channel where um, folks that are using Stream Streamzy in earnest come and ask questions and, uh, and get feedback on their configurations. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I won't read through these. I took these from the TOC issue. So I think Chris has, Chris will paste in the TOC issue perhaps uh, so that everyone can see. But um, you, you know, you've, we've got four Red Hat people on the call here. I just wanted to uh, give some quotes here from people outside of Red Hat, just to em emphasize that this isn't, um, it's not, solely useful to to red hat folks or, or something like that uh, next slide please so why are we talking to you guys why do we think this is a good fit um, well so firstly strimzy is fully open source um, it's licensed with an apache license uh, but it's you know it's a pure open source thing in the sense that it's not the foundation to some open core bigger thing it's a pure open source project and the goal is to to satisfy all of the needs that uh, folks will have of running Apache Kafka through through this project um, as I pointed out before Kafka's usage on kube is significant and growing and increasingly we're seeing Kafka being used in other projects so I mentioned here uh, Knative so the Knative eventing has the abstract the notion of an abstract uh, communication channel. Um, I think many folks are looking at Kafka as an implementation of that uh, of that eventing channel as a concrete example. And we've integrated Streamzy with Knative eventing upstream. Um, so what we're hoping to gain from the exercise, uh, so we would like, I guess, formally declare, we'd like to become a sandbox project at CNCF. Um, and the main the main focus here is about increasing awareness. So whenever, whenever we present about Streamzy or talk to people about Streamzy and they play with it, the reaction is uniformly positive. Um, I just wish we could have more people become aware of the work that, that's happened here. So that's the, that's the primary reason, I think, to, to sort of increase awareness. And as part of that, you know, we would like to get greater community involvement. So we've, we've got a reasonable community, the, you know, the people that, the quotes that I mentioned on the previous slides, uh, they're people from other firms that have made contributions here. And um, so it's not purely a Red Hat thing, but I'd really like this to become a, a true community project and, and just become a neutral home, you know, so um, for, for Streamzy. And I think that was it. So we'd be happy to take any questions. David, I've got some questions. It's Alexis here. Oh, hey, Alexis. Um, hi. Uh, so um, do you think there are technical lessons to be learned from um, running Kafka on Kubernetes in this way that can be applied to other uh, projects than Kafka that might want to run on Kubernetes but are not themselves um, a queue-based or, or, or log-based system? Yeah, well, I think there's there's some general um, general lessons learned about you know you can look through Streamzy and and see the you know just the challenges of dealing with a complex stateful system and and how to automate how to automate that. Um, I think what the idea you know it used to be the case if we rewind a, a couple of years it used to be the case that that just the idea of bringing something like Kafka to Kubernetes, you know, you'd be, you'd be scared off of that, you know, when, when um, stateful sets first arrived, that was the, 
the thing that sort of made it potentially possible, but it's still a, a you know, pretty complex task. I think what Strimsy has shown is that, you know, it, it, it is possible to, to build systems like this and, and, um, you know, you get a lot of advantages by automating a lot of what would typically be done by operational experts that, that you've employed to manage your, your, uh, cluster, you know, in the same way that you hire your database management system experts. I think that the fact that if you're able to, you know, look at systematically at the, what the operational needs are and focus. But, but, but David, I mean, as an example, um, having previously tried to build a, a queues as a service thing myself, one of the things that you end up building is a, is a quota system so that you can allocate different quotas to different users of the system. Yeah. That would be something you could imagine yeah, for something sure. other than Kafka. Um, I mean, this, I'm, I'm coming at this question that's popped up on the chat about oh. you know, there's, other, there's other operators. Yeah, you should have a look at it. There's, 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 uh, Chris pointed out there are several other operators in the uh, operator framework slash awesome operators, including there's also a Confluent operator. Um, That's right. We'd like to know, um, you know, what is your view about if you want to have the whole community and it's not be just a red hat thing, yeah. then I think there's, there needs to be a rationale, which could be, well, actually, you know, there are technical reasons to put this in close proximity with Kubernetes because there are other uh, components that can be transposed to other projects. And, um, you know, it's fine to have multiple different operator implementations, but ultimately it's a good thing for this to be developed by people who are looking at Kubernetes as a whole rather than people who are looking at Kafka specifically. And this is a really important question for us as an organization because um, there's gonna, if, you, if you wonder about what projects could we have that are Kubernetes for X, uh, there's potentially a lot of Xs out there. We could end up with billions of these things. <laughs> so um, you know, there's, we've got to draw the line somewhere and we don't know where to draw it. Uh, so we've got to start asking tough questions about um, specifics. Yeah, um, they're good challenges to have, right? To to uh, be in a, a popular position where the ecosystem is growing at such a rate that you have all of these projects um, looking to um, looking to bring them to CNCF. Um, so, with regard to the other operators that are out there, um, I know that there is. I know Confluent ha do have an operator. I haven't seen it. It's um, it's closed source, so I don't know. I don't know a great right. deal about it. Others may, others may, others may know. Um, in Quentin terms, has a question, by the way. Okay, Quinton, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, you guys seem to have done, you know, some work running Zookeeper as well as as um, Kafka, and the Zookeeper stuff alone could be quite independently useful. I was just wondering if you've ever considered splitting that part out, um, so that someone wanting to run Zookeeper, but not Kafka would be able to use that part of the project? We, we haven't done, but it would be trivial to do so. Um, yeah, that, that might be a super useful. I mean, not necessarily as a, you know, a blocking uh, requirement, but in the future, uh, being able to have the Zookeeper part of it independently consumable would potentially be very useful. Yeah. We, you know, our, for us, Zookeeper was um, a means to an end, you know, a prereq for, for the cluster. But we could absolutely, um, if, if other folks thought, thought that that was independently consumable, independently valuable, we could definitely um, expose that. I think that could be the key to getting this thing into a good, good state. It looks like some of the other uh, operators may have kind of been experiments. Um, and the confluent being closed source obviously answers that question. But I do think that, I mean, I, I would like to put up my hand as a potential sponsor because um, I'm very excited about this, this area. Um, but I would like to know what is your step-by-step -step plan for this becoming a community neutral project uh, rather than, you know, just a, just the Red Hat thing. Well, I think to be, to be fair, I think it's a community neutral project right now in the sense that, you know, we accept con contribute contributions from non Red Hat people, and there've been um, there've been a number. And those comments that I plucked from the TOC, they weren't from Red Hat people, and they were uh, con like Lightband and WeWork and, and other firms that have been contributing to the operator. But I 
I know what you mean. Like we have a significant team that's working on this. Um, so it is a, you know, you could form the perception that it's a red hat thing. And that's the, like I called out here, that's one of the reasons that we want to bring it to CNCF to build a real community around it. You know, at Red Hat, we know, we know the value of, of um, multi-vendor rich open source projects and we'd like to turn this into that. Yeah, Joe made a good point about open governance, roadmap owned by the community. Yeah. We, we went through a similar evolution with, with Weave Cortex, which is now a CNCF project. And we actually work on it with uh, companies that we compete with. And that actually works really quite well, in fact. Um, but it, the key stage was moving to open governance and a community owned roadmap and, and encouraging that way of working. Yeah, I, I think we would be absolutely amenable to that. I think it would help, just given because there are so many other uh, operator implementations that um, a naive person might look at and say, well, how is this different from this? So, yeah, it would espouse our values in the right way. All right. Thanks so much, David. That was great. Yeah. In the interest of time, we're a minute over. Again, I want to be respectful for everyone's time here. I kicked off discussions for both Key Cloak and Strimzy on the TOC mailing list. So please um, move that discussion there. And hopefully these projects will find TOC sponsors and we'll go from there. So other than that, I want to thank everyone for their time today. And uh, thank you for fitting in three projects today. It's great. Take care, all. Thank you.